Charlotte. And I'm Dina. Welcome to The Grim Curriculum. Welcome, welcome. We missed a week because we were taking a little time to uh, recoup and I was actually spending some time up in Jasper in the mountains. And let me tell you, it's a little strange to see snow when it's still very much brown here in Edmonton. What is happening? It's so bizarre. I have not experienced getting so late into November without having some long lasting sort of here to stay snow. And we're recording this on the 30th of November. So if it does not snow by midnight tonight, it's going to be the first time in the history of Edmonton where we haven't had snow throughout November, which is crazy. It's insane. And to be honest, it's been quite warm because I can't remember if I mentioned this already or not. As you guys know, I repeat myself from time to time. But I remember being like at the Legion on Remembrance Day, November 11th, and absolutely freezing my fucking tits off when we're standing outside at the Cenotaph. And it was like minus 25, minus 30. And I was like, Dear God, can we just go inside and get a beer, please? (laughs) It's weird because, like, I'm wondering, what are the consequences of this? Because this can't be right. Like, are we going to get snow? Are we not? Are we just going to get, like, a shit ton of it all in one go? I have to say, I will be a smidge disappointed if we end up having a brown Christmas. Um, We have some family coming down to our place for the first time this Christmas. And it would be kind of nice to have that little bit of snow But it makes me worry that we're going to have a really long, painful winter sort of Christmas onward. Like, are we still going to be suffering from the cold and the snow in May? I sure hope not. It's happened. I mean, it has. It sure has. (laughs) It's funny because when we were first planning the live show, which is coming up, we'll get to that in a second. We were talking about how, oh, it's going to be, you know, December. It's going to be so snowy and cold and this and that. And it's I think it's going to be lovely. Yeah, I think it's not going to be an issue, especially for folks coming maybe a little further afield from out of town and stuff. At least your drive is going to look like pretty dry and good, I think. Yeah, I mean, we won't get snowed in. So there's that bonus. And that live show, dear listeners, is coming right up. Yes. And we also have a giveaway happening for two tickets. As you're listening, the winner is being drawn now that I think about it. So uh, yeah, keep your eyes and your ears peeled for that. We'll get in touch with you. (laughs) So yes, the live show coming up December 9th, which is a Saturday at 7 p.m. Felice Cafe. We're super stoked. And uh, yeah, I'm like shaking with excitement just thinking about it. We are so close. Actually, just a week away. Amazing. It's the first time we're doing this. That's amazing. And I hope it's the first of many. It's going to be a good time. It's almost sold out. Like, we're getting there. So get those tickets. It's going to be such a fun time. Oh, my God. I can't wait. Yes, absolutely. Now, I believe as well, if there are tickets left, they will be available on the night. But I couldn't for sure guarantee it. So just keep that in mind as well if you're thinking about stopping by, but you haven't gotten your ticket yet. All right. Are you ready? Oh, yeah. I feel like we were kind of procrastinating this a little (laughs) bit. Uh, But yes, I guess ready as I will ever be. Before we get started, we want to give you guys a big old content warning. Yes, because while we do talk about a lot of pretty rough subjects, this is going to be one of the more, but not the most difficult in this series. But brace yourself nonetheless. I have a pretty strong stomach when it comes to this kind of stuff. Like, I think a lot of us can relate. You get desensitized to a point after a little while, but this is top tier awful. Yes, absolutely. I have a pretty strong stomach when it comes to things like this. And like you say, probably due to the desensitization, I've been interested in the more morbid things of life for a really long time. But this is truly one that will turn your stomach. Today, we are picking up right where we left off with Rock Terrio. And this week, we're actually going to find out all about his followers, the Ant Hill Kids. This is a story of manipulation, murder, and a whole lot of sex. In all seriousness, folks, just brace yourselves. We last left off with Rock now teaching a stop smoking course. This provided him with not just an audience, but a group of people who were highly impressionable and looking for answers. 
and they were so impressed by him. He was a fantastic speaker. It was said that he would captivate an entire room. He made people laugh, and they ended up having a great time with him. Like we mentioned last week, he would put on little skits for the group, and overall, it seemed like everyone was indeed having a good time. Honestly, this starts off very innocently, but that is going to change real quick. It didn't take long until the seminars were doing very well. Rock had taken the lead with a lot of the Seventh-day Adventist work in town, which allowed for more recruitment to happen in the surrounding areas. The man who had originally brought Rock into the religion, Pastor Pierre Zita, was now recruiting people faster than ever. And this is how 21-year-old Solange Boyard got brought into the mix. And oh, my poor heart, Solange. Oh, like, oh. I hear her name and I just like feel sad. Absolutely. Solange hadn't even had an easy life to begin with. Her father was an alcoholic who abused her mother in horrific ways. He was terrible to his entire family and her younger years were obviously full of stress and pain. Rock Terrio was the worst kind of person for her to meet. She ended up becoming utterly devoted to him in every way, and that's something that would prove to be fatal for her. She had grown up with very little love in her home and clearly a horrible male figure in her life. She then meets Rock, and he's this charismatic, amazing man who seems to have all of the answers. The seminars that he did were about quitting smoking, yes, but Rock would also talk about the importance of living an overall healthy lifestyle that had a full devotion to God. Which, kind of when you put it that way, doesn't really sound that bad. No, it really doesn't. But then he started bringing up the fact that maybe, just maybe, they should all drop out of school or quit their jobs, run away from society, and live out in the wilderness with him. Along with Solange came a small group that included Chantal Labrie, Francine Laflamme, Nicole Ruel, Josie Pelletier, Jacques Fissette, and Claude Ulliette. They were all in their late teens and early 20s. 24-year-old Jacques Guillier and his wife Maurice and their six-month-old little girl also joined them. In part one, we established that Rock was a person who had very little empathy for those around him. Absolutely. We have very narcissistic behavior from him so far. And what does a narcissistic person love more than anything else? Attention and admiration. And Rock was getting plenty of it. Solange and the majority of these other followers very quickly all had nowhere to go. They had dropped out of school, left their jobs, and needed a place to stay. Rock kindly offered that they move in with him and Giselle. Which is absolutely bonkers considering the fact that they had a tiny apartment and this was now becoming a pretty big group of people. Although that being said, not everyone lived in the apartment at that time. Some people came and went, but at any given time there were at least four people staying with them. It didn't take long until Giselle developed a problem with all these young women who were now living in her house and obsessed with her boyfriend. Like, can you blame her, though? Like, you're Giselle. All of a sudden, your man moves a bunch of random people into your home that are all barely adults, I'm going to point out. And they're all obsessed with him. Like, I'd be pissed. Oh, and she knows he's capable of cheating because he cheated on his first wife with her. Exactly. And there's constantly, like, new people just showing up. Like, this is getting away from her very quickly. And... While he isn't openly sleeping with any of them at this point or anything like that, but they're all getting very physically close on a regular basis. Lots of uh, group massages. Uh, No, thank you. (laughs) Look at that face and just picture him massaging you. (laughs) No, absolutely not. That makes my fucking skin crawl. (laughs) It really didn't help that he basically told Giselle, this is just the way it's going to be, honey, and that her new role would be to take care of everyone. And as his wife, it was her duty to cook and clean and make sure him and his followers were well looked after. Now, you're probably wondering how the hell he convinced her that this is the way it was going to be. Well, he had led her into this new life of devotion to God, and he explained to her that if she was serious about that, that she would open her home to the group. Basically, if you don't do this, you're going to be punished by God later. Nothing like some good old religious guilt to get you through the day. 
That very same year, Rock and his new followers attended a Seventh-day Adventist retreat in Muskoka, Ontario. He claimed during this time that while hiking in the woods, he climbed up on a large rocky area and the sky lit up. God himself proclaimed to him that the spot he was in was a holy place. This was when he also met Gabrielle Lavallee and Yolande Guimbert, who quickly joined the group along with everybody else. With these very quickly growing numbers, Rock decided that it was time for them to leave Thetford Mines and set their sights elsewhere. He chose Saint-Marie, a small town south of Quebec City. There, they opened the quote-unquote Healthy Living Clinic, a place where they sold healthy food, vitamins, and various types of literature on holistics. Rock would host seminars, and he ended up gaining popularity as a healer of sorts. And he had his followers, and they were starting to make some money, and now it was time for another important step of starting a cult, the uniforms. Exactly. Stripping away as much of your individuality is key for creating cult members. He had all of the women wear an ankle-length green tunic while the men wore a beige one. Rock wore a similar outfit. However, he was the only one who was allowed to wear brown. During this time, Leo Marc Fauché joined the group. He quickly sold all of his possessions to help fund the health store. Now, if this was just like a guy who had few ties to anything, this is what he wanted to do, that wouldn't be that bad. But he had a wife and a baby to take care of. And one day he just sold all of his stuff and joined a cult. All of this red flag behavior just made Rock hornier than ever. And it didn't take long until one woman just was not cutting it anymore. He began to set his sights on all of the women there, even the married ones. With the exception of Marie's Grenier, who didn't really want to be there in the first place, all of them wanted Rock and they wanted him bad. This led to them competing for his attention literally every waking second, which, of course, enraged Giselle. Uh, I guess this guy had a lot of sex appeal, apparently, but... I mean, ugh. legitimate question, judgment-free zone, Charlotte. Is Rock Terrio a sexy guy in any way? All this fucking nasty shit aside, even from just like an aesthetic point of view, he does not do it for me. No thank you. No way in hell. Yeah, no. No. He's like, he's a guy that you wouldn't want to run into in a back alley, you know? (laughs) And you know what? These were like good looking ladies. Yeah. I mean, they're uh, the thing is, they're always all wonderful and smart and gorgeous human beings. And then this trash asshole just comes along and ruins it all. He is a trash asshole. You're right. (laughs) Oh, man. All that aside, back to poor Giselle. I mean, she's now dealing with the reality that she could very easily lose her boyfriend to one of the other women. And she took this as a sign that it was time to get Rock to fully commit. So rather than wait for him, she proposed to him herself. It took Rock a week to say yes. Very political of you. (laughs) What a dick. Like, he's such an asshole. Oh, such a prick. The two were married in a seven-day Adventist church on January 8th, 1978. The group tagged along for the five-hour drive to Montreal. Giselle would later say that she felt a traditional Adventist wedding would be something Rock would take seriously and that this would be a way to ensure he would stay faithful to her. It probably won't come as any surprise to you to know that this was absolutely not the case. In fact, the entire drive home was spent with the girls fawning over Rock and giggling while Giselle cried her eyes out in the back of the van on a mattress. (sighs) Trash, I tell you. Trash asshole. (laughs) Those who encountered the group on a regular basis were beginning to develop some very serious concerns. One of those people was Pastor Zita. He went as far as to find as many of the young women's parents and warn them about Rock. Some of the parents contacted the police, but were met with smiling young women who told them that they were happy, healthy, and thriving. The thing is that even if the police didn't believe them, they couldn't do anything about it because they were adults in what appeared to be a very happy, albeit strange, lifestyle. Pastor Zita even sat down Giselle and desperately tried to convince her to leave her horrible new husband. But like all of the other women, she just couldn't bear to leave Rock's side. 
In March of 1978, a 38-year-old woman named Geraldine Eau Claire began to visit the Healthy Living Clinic. She had met with Rock, who convinced her that he could cure her leukemia. She had been in the hospital, and apparently the course of treatment she was undergoing was actually working pretty well, and it looked like she was going to beat it. Guys, this part is so sad. I just want you to prepare for it. It's awful. Oh my god. (laughs) Rock convinced her husband to let him visit her in the hospital, which basically just resulted in him yelling at all of her doctors for the amount of drugs that they were giving her and how it wasn't actually healthy to do that. This woman went from being in the hospital for treatment to abandoning all of that in favor of Rock's treatment plan. This was something her husband greatly disagreed with at first. However, Rock was able to convince him to completely change his mind on the matter. The treatment plan, which was basically just giving her only organic foods and a whole lot of grape juice, which just goes again to show how convincing he was. He forbade anyone from visiting her, including her own father. Geraldine died a short time after. Rock told his followers that he kissed her when he saw that she was dead, which brought her back to life, but only briefly, and she died once again. He said, You know, when God wants people, he takes them. It was Geraldine's time. Oh my, this, what a piece of shit. How dare you? You killed this woman. You bastard. You killed this woman because you thought you were fucking magical. I, the delusional The delusional nonsense that this man is living his life by. I don't get it. And he's like, you know what? Whatevs, it happens. Yeah. God's plan, you know? Fuck. Ugh. During all of this, Rock was still hosting his stop smoking workshops. And this is where he met the parents of 19-year-old Gabrielle Nadeau. She had been suffering with multiple sclerosis. And before long, he had convinced them that he could cure their daughter. By April of 1978, the Seventh-day Adventist had finally had enough of all the terrible things Rock was doing, and they voted him out of the religion. This was something that Pastor Zita was in the forefront of. He very quickly regretted recruiting Rock into the religion. Like, he was like, holy shit, this was the worst decision I have ever made. Rock was absolutely fine with their decision because he didn't need them anymore. He now had his own group. And you know what? He hasn't done anything super cult leader in a hot minute, and he's going to make up for it in a big way right now. One day, he woke up and he decided that he had the authority to not only perform weddings, but he was going to pick and choose members of the group and marry them. And they had absolutely no say in who they were married to. Rock was going to match them. He knew them best, and they just needed to trust him. Solange and Claude were paired up, and she had written to her parents and asked them to attend the wedding. They hadn't approved of her moving out with the group, and they definitely didn't want to see their daughter marry some random guy that they were literally just hearing about. They went to their priest, who advised them to attend, not because they agreed with what was happening, but because it was important for Solange to see that they still loved her and that they were there for her. During the wedding, Rock rambled on about the importance of women obeying men. This obviously made her family very uncomfortable, and it was reported that the majority of them were crying throughout the entire wedding and that they were obviously not happy tears. Woof. Something I want to talk about is, can you imagine how stressful it would be to have a family member who's actively in a cult? I can't even imagine trying to delicately get through to them when they've been, you know, gaslit and brainwashed and yada yada. You like know this person and all of a sudden it's like you've you just lost them. It's almost like losing someone to addiction, right? Like they're not listening to you anymore. They're they've changed as a person and you're just trying to gently get them back. If we have anyone listening who has an experience with this kind of thing, we would love to hear from you. Email us at thegrimcurriculum at gmail.com. Tell us your cult stories. Yeah, that's it's crazy. And we've actually we've got one here in Alberta right now, but that's for a that's a story for another time. Actually, Mm. not Alberta, sorry, Saskatchewan, but not too far away. Another newly paired couple was Jacques Fissette and Nicole Ruel. And if you're wondering why Rock is marrying off all these women who clearly wanted to have sex with him, don't worry, he has all that figured out and we will get to it later. 
<laughs> yeah, he definitely makes up for it. Now, during all of this, he's still intimate with his wife, Giselle, and this resulted in her becoming pregnant in the spring of that following year. A baby on the way made her want Rock to get his shit together even more and be a good husband to her, so she gave him an ultimatum. Break up the group, or I'm going to leave and I'm going to move in with my dad. Rock's answer to this was to punch her in the mouth and tell her that not only was she not allowed to leave him, that she had to stay locked in their bedroom for two days. He escalates so fast. So quickly. As soon as you speak out against him, he lashes out. And we will see that this escalates very, very big, big, bad, not good. (laughs) The thing to remember is he's sober right now. He's still not drinking. Like, he hasn't even started getting back to the alcohol, you guys. No, honestly, he's probably healthier than most people right now. Like, they're living a very healthy lifestyle. They're looking after themselves because it's all part of this religion. But, yeah, we'll, we'll see it get quite out of control before long. By June of 1978, the Healthy Living Clinic was beginning to die. Overall, the business itself was doing pretty well. However, they had a lot of debt and it was quickly accumulating. After the death of Geraldine Eau Claire, the police became very suspicious of the group and were constantly watching them. They had also lost the full support of the church, and in the past, they had them to fall back on. The church would help them out financially and provide food and whatever they needed if they asked, and this being gone was a hit that the group felt very strongly. Overall, things weren't going very well for the group. Luckily, Rock had a solution. They had to move. Now, this is where we really start to crash downwards into full-blown cult territory. He loaded everyone up into multiple vehicles and off they went. Rock had them travel from town to town until they found themselves in the Gas Peninsula. It was there that Rock proclaimed that he had a vision. The world was going to end on February 17th, 1979. There would be a giant storm where boulder-sized hail would fall from the sky. The earth would shatter and lightning would strike from every angle, killing everyone. Except for them. All they had to do was agree to every single thing Rock said. He would guide them to a righteous life that would guarantee that they would be the only ones who would remain safe from the upcoming apocalypse. In early July of that year, the group hiked for two days until they found a small body of water called Lac Sec, which translates to Dry Lake. Rock renamed the area Eternal Mountain and told the group that this is where they were going to make their home. They set up their tents and spent days hiking to their vehicles to bring back supplies to build a large communal cabin. Rock had them work 17-hour days, and this was hard labor. To ensure food didn't run out, Rock told them that they had to ration it. Long hours and little food led to people complaining about hunger and being tired. Like with everything else thus far, Rock had a solution. He would simply feed the people who complained less. It's so simple. Just starve them more. If you're hungry, you can't speak. Yeah, you're going to be too busy being hungry, so just shut up and work. Exactly. Now, if it sounds like everyone's busting their butts trying to get this place built as quickly as possible, they definitely were, except, of course, for Rock. Because if you remember, in part one, he told Giselle that he had cancer. Now, he apparently still had it, and because of that, he couldn't do the physical work. He simply explained to them that it was his job to not do the work with them, but to guide them and help ensure salvation for the group. He would often remind them that the alternative to not listening to him was certain death. Anytime they expressed that they missed their old lives or their families, he simply told them that everyone they knew was going to be dead soon anyway and that they should love him instead. After all, he was the only one that could save them. Not everyone in the group was falling for this. Yolande Ginber paced the fuck out around this time. Lucky for them, Leo Fauché removed his family from the group around this time as well. At this point, Rock had bled the family dry financially and they didn't have much. But at least they all escaped before Rock could do anything to hurt them too badly, including their small child. He did, however, do everything in his power to stain their reputation, telling the group that the Fauché family was evil in the eyes of God. 
By September, the cabin was finished. When everything was said and done, they were left with one large room with a well in the center of it. The ceiling had been constructed from twigs and moss, while the bedrooms were separated by sheets. Rock renamed all of his followers and told them that they would spend the next 1,000 years in the cabin. Wow, what a thrilling concept. I am just, oh, just ready to spend 1,000 years with Rock Terrio. Jesus Christ. In his dirt cabin. Oh my god, you guys, what is happening? Get out of there. <laughs> right? Like, it just, that's the thing with this story is it gets so bad and it snowballs so fast. And it's out of control. And it's like all of a sudden they're living in this one room cabin in the middle of the woods with a well in the middle. And like not really any food to speak of and certainly very low financial stability. I mean, to give you a a glimpse into where Rock is in his God complex right now. It was around this time when he nicknamed himself Moses or Pappy while Giselle was nicknamed Mammy. During this time, he spoke to the women of the group and he somehow convinced them to convince Giselle to talk to him and help him find a solution for their loneliness. A few nights later, Nicole Ruel told her that her and Rock had slept together one day while everyone was working. Giselle was absolutely devastated by this. Still pregnant, she ran away from the cabin in an attempt to finally escape the clutches of Rock Terrio. He caught her and strangled her until she agreed to return to the compound. Whether this was part of his plan or maybe just a way to punish Giselle, we aren't sure. But his next step was to tell everyone that all of the marriages that he had officiated were now void and that now all of the women were married to him and him only. He then slept with everyone except Maurice Grenier because she still wanted nothing to do with him. And he also didn't sleep with Gabrielle Nadeau for the fact that she was just too ill to sleep with him. Then came November 18th, 1978, a day that really stands out in history. 981 people were found dead at Jonestown, a remote settlement in Guyana led by Jim Jones. And that's a case that we are 100% covering in the future. Oh, definitely. I mean, the Jonestown incident caused the families of the group members to become even more concerned for the safety of their loved ones, and so much so that they actually had Rock examined by a psychologist. He was quickly released. However, it's important to note that he left out all the stuff about him being their leader, the polyamory, and the fact that the end of the world was coming. So now comes the time that Rock completely abandons his healthy ways and he went straight back to a diet of junk food and alcohol and it didn't take long until he was giving long rambling sermons while drunk out of his tree. With the alcohol came more severe punishments. Maurice became pregnant and of course this meant that she ate more. One day, she ate more than the two pancakes she was allowed, and Rock broke her ribs as punishment. Another punishment he particularly enjoyed was to make anyone who upset him strip naked and stand in the snow for hours. And they would do this for him. They were way too afraid to stand up to him, let alone question him in any way. If you want to see just how brainwashed they were at this point, we can look at Francine Laflamme, who Rock had renamed Hogla. Oh my god. Isn't that terrible? It's a biblical name, you guys. It's a biblical name. Oh, but uh... Poor Francine. Like, what the fuck? So according to Rock, she had put on a few pounds, but that is so fucking cruel and unusual. I hate it so much. Oh, this is going to piss you off even more because here is a letter that Rock had her write to him about the matter. Oh, Jesus. Okay, here we go. I am writing about what you said on the subject of nutrition. It is very true that I nibble, a damnable fault which I will never repeat again. The thought of ingesting such a large quantity of food in so little time discourages me, even if I work outside the entire day without eating. I ask that you forgive me. If it is stealing, I did not realize it. It is this fault which causes my plumpness. 
I do not want to be a fat and plump servant that is too ugly next to the man that you are. Man, this is so fucking upsetting. Oh, this makes me so mad. Uh, I don't know what to think about everything and the meaning of my actions. I only know that I will not repeat them and I don't speak lightly. I wish to be a true servant to you, my master. Alert, vigorous, with a clear and lively spirit, and well-balanced to serve you every moment of my life. I have a long way to go. Thank you, Pappy. I love you. Hogla. Yep. Oh, my God. This piece of shit, I swear to God. This is how brainwashed they were. Awful. I, I hate it. And to be honest... Uh, men don't have a great track record, historically speaking, and this guy sure does not help it. The worst thing about I'm a, I'm going back to Hogla because like I have to is he gave them all biblical names, but yes. all of the other women got very pretty names, and then Go she figure. got Hogla. That is so upsetting. Maurice was the next to talk about openly leaving, and Rock demanded her husband cut off one of her toes as punishment. When he was shocked by this request, Rock responded, What are you? And uh, he asked, he answered that for the fella. He put a gay slur in there for him. Uh, And he said, Don't you have any balls? If you want to be a man, you have to learn to teach your woman a lesson. When poor Jacques began to cry, Rock grabbed an axe and told him that he would just cut off all of her toes instead. Jacques, still crying, grabbed the axe and severed a toe off of the foot of his own wife. And just like that, Rock not only had followers who were willing to do anything for him, he now had an enforcer. And that's where we will pick things up in part three of Rock Terrio and the Ant Hill Kids. I hate to say it, but it gets worse than this, guys. This is truly a nasty, nasty story. He hasn't even started torturing anyone, really. Like, I mean, he cut off or he threatened to cut off toes. That's it so far. Yeah, he hasn't done anything himself, per se. I mean, he's obviously been a physically and emotionally and mentally abusive piece of shit. But we see him escalate so much more and see him really get his hands dirty. He's evil. He is pure evil, and we've seen it. He has no empathy. He gave no fucks. He was God in his own mind, and he loved every single minute of it. I think the irony of him thinking of himself in such a holy manner, if demons do indeed exist on this earth, he was fucking one of them. That's for damn sure. I mean, the thing that is going to come up in the next episode, too, is... Like we mentioned, he's having a lot of sex. People are going to start getting pregnant and he's going to start having a whole bunch of kids. And boy, howdy, there's a lot of them, guys. <sighs> All right. Okay, outro things. We have a live show. Yes, we already mentioned that. You guys know the drill. But December 9th, Felice Cafe. It's a week away. I can't wait. Honestly, it's going to be amazing. Get those tickets. Do the thing. It's going to be a fabulous time. I'm absolutely stoked. I was just at the cafe the other day. It's it's a lovely venue and it's going to be just awesome. Yes, absolutely. I am super stoked. Now is the time. Again, we've missed this for a week now. It's time to thank our lovely patrons over on Patreon. Thank you so, so, so much to Bob, Lisa, Atlantean Jedi, Brian, Hillary, Judy, and Mayhem Mudkip. Woo! Thank you so much, guys. You're awesome. You know it. The titty city, the bee's knees, the cat's pajamas. You rock. We appreciate you all so much. And thank you all so much for listening. This has been The The Grim Grim Curriculum. Curriculum. Today's thought is not so much of a fact as it is just, I guess, food for thought. When you brush your teeth, it's really the only opportunity you have to clean your own skeleton. Oh, I don't like that. I don't like that. <laughs> <laughs> they are the only parts of your pers- er, your skeleton that should be protruding from your skin. Uh, but yeah, so just keep that in mind next time you're brushing your toothies. Keep those bones clean. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye.